Hi, everyone. Welcome. If you would like, use the chat and let us know where you're tuning in from. It's always so fun to see where everyone is. We'll let people get logged in a little bit before we get started. Welcome. West Seattle, I think that says, I'm gonna put my glasses on. I'm sorry, it's gonna make like a weird thing with my ring light. Ooh, Ohio and Ballard. Hello and welcome. Cheyenne, Wyoming. Oh, originally from Port Townsend. Hello, San Antonio, more Ballard. Mercer Island. Hood Canal, North Seattle, more Ballard. <laughs> Ballard will be snacking on cakes this fall. Bothell, Broadview, hello everyone. Denver, Portland, Redmond, Bellingham. Oh, Wallingford, I'm in Wallingford. Oh, hi, Lori. Kansas, Cincinnati. Silver Spring, hi, Lars. Ballard, Green Lake, this is so fun. Thank you, everyone. Columbia City. Tacoma. <laughs> Hello, Upper Fremont. All right. Upstate New York. All right, we're going to go ahead and get started. I'm going to take my glasses off again so that I stop uh, hypnotizing all of you with the weird ring lights. Hello. Welcome. So glad all of you could join us this evening. I'm Lara Hamilton, and I have a cookbook shop, actually, I almost said bookshop, cookbook shop here in Seattle called Book Larder in Seattle's Fremont neighborhood. And we typically host a lot of author talks and cooking classes in our kitchen. And during the pandemic, we've taken all of that to Zoom. So thank you so much for joining us. One of the things that's been so much fun about that is just um, getting to sort of have a little roll call at the beginning and see that people are tuning in from all over the country and sometimes all over the world um, for these events. And it's also giving us the chance to talk with authors that um, sometimes we don't get to host and sometimes, um, you know, are just far enough away that uh, they might not make it to Seattle. Today's author, however, typically does make it to Seattle because she grew up here, Yossi Arefi, um, and her wonderful new book, Snacking Cakes, um, is what we are celebrating today. She's going to be in conversation with local author and creator of the Lioness website, Olaya Land. They go back a ways and have worked together before, so um, I'm sure that they will talk maybe a little bit at least about their travels. They will also leave time for questions. So we're going to ask you to please use the Q&A button rather than the chat um, for your questions. You can use the, the chat to sort of talk to each other or comment as the talk is going on. But if you want, if you have a question that you want to see answered, please use that Q&A button um, on Zoom for your questions. And there are lots of you tuned in, so we'll get to as many of them as possible. The book, Snacking Cakes, many of you have ordered already, is uh, for sale on our website. We are getting more book plates from Yossi, and so we will have signed uh, copies that we'll be sending out very, very soon. And um, you can support this talk by buying it from us, and we would be very grateful. You can uh, have it shipped, or you can pick it up at Book Larder. All right, so without further ado, Olaya and Yossi, would you please join us? And I will step away. Hello and welcome. Hello. Hello. Hello, everybody. <laughs> Yay. Yeah, before we start, before I start asking Yasi questions, I just want to take a minute to just show you guys if you haven't had your, don't have your hands on this book yet, I just want to show you how beautiful it is. Which is like, my favorite absolutely spread. gorgeous. I know, me too. <laughs> this beauty right here, this berry cream cheesecake, I've got my eye on this one. I wanted, I opened this up and I immediately just wanted to bake everything. The book is so, so beautiful. Look at this, salty caramel peanut butter cake. What? I'll show you a couple more pictures. 
simple sesame cake. I also really, really want to make this one. Anyway, yeah, see, when I got the book and I opened it up, I was like, holy shit, where am I going to start baking? Down? <laughs> I want to bake everything in here. <laughs> so congratulations on creating such a gorgeous book. It's really beautiful. Um, and before we talk about the book and the process of the book and the recipes, I just want to talk, I want to ask you for people who don't know you to talk a little bit about your background. Like I know you're a pastry chef, you're a blogger, a photographer, a food stylist. Tell us your story. How did you, how did you get All here? All the things. Uh, yeah. So yes. How did I get here? I don't know. Um, I, when I graduated from college, I kind of didn't really have a plan. And um, my boyfriend at the time, who is still my boyfriend, although I'm too old to call my boyfriend, so I call my partner. Um, <laughs> he got a job opportunity in New York and was like, hey, I'm going to New York and I think you should come with me. And I was like, I will never ever go to New York. I don't want to live on the East Coast. I grew up in the Pacific Northwest. That is my place. I will always be there. And then I like lived with my parents for a summer and was like, I gotta get out of here. Gotta so, go. <laughs> I gotta go. Um, and so while I was in Seattle and all throughout college, I had worked at like specialty food shops and I was really into food, especially when I was in Portland for college. Um, we had these neighbors that like were so passionate about cooking. And I just kind of discovered that like you could be passionate about cooking as a job and you don't have to work in a restaurant and you can do it in a bunch of different ways. Um, but when I moved to New York, I didn't really have a plan. And so I thought, well, maybe I'll go to New York and I'll go to culinary school to like get some foundations of cooking and, and kind of go that route. And then I went and toured all the culinary schools and I realized that it cost like 40 grand and that when I got out, I would get a job that paid me $8 an hour. And I like, couldn't make that math work. Yeah. Um, and so <laughs> what I decided to do instead was like, well, maybe I could just like get a job at a restaurant and pursue food in that way. And also part of me always thought that like our life in New York would be temporary and we wouldn't, we wouldn't, you know, be there that long. So I didn't have to find anything that was super permanent. I could just kind of have fun. Um, and so I ended up getting a job at this restaurant that was in my neighborhood as a reservationist. And the restaurant also had a bakery and uh, like they did a bunch of cake decorating and specialty cakes. And so I was kind of like food adjacent working as a reservationist. Um, and I was a terrible reservationist and I was not, <laughs> I was not suited for the job, mm -hmm. um, but I liked the place and I liked the people and the kitchen seemed pretty like relaxed. It wasn't like a, it wasn't, we weren't working at night. It was like pretty relaxed kitchen and so, I would like bring in cookies that I had made from home to show my boss like, look, I can bake and look, I can make a cupcake and I can do all this stuff. And so when someone in the kitchen left, um, I said, hey, I really like working for you. I think I'm not very good at my current job, but I think I could be good at this other job. And he gave me a chance. And so I worked in that kitchen in the bakery for almost six years. And I did mostly early morning, like 5 a.m. Uh, scone baking shifts. And I also so wait, learned I, how to do cake. I got to ask you for a So are you a morning person? I like to work in the morning. Yeah. Okay. So it's a good um, fit. And it wasn't like I had to get ready for work. It wasn't like I had to like do my hair and like put on an outfit. It was just like put on a clean t-shirt and like bring a clean apron and that was it. Mm -hmm. um, I rode the bus. Uh, across Central Park every morning at 4.30 with like the night shift guy from my bodega. We'd ride the bus together. It was like a very nice experience. I really enjoyed it. I loved working mornings. I loved being finished with work at one o'clock in the afternoon and like having a whole day to mm -hmm. explore whatever. So I did that for quite a while. Um, and I hit, you know, hit the five, six year mark. And I was like, well, what do I like? What do I want next? What do I want from this? And kind of during that time I had started a food blog and uh, which kind of combined my passion that I had for food and my other passion, which was photography, which was something that I had studied in school kind of casually, um, but it was something that I always loved and it was always part of my life. And, and so this food blogging world, which was kind of, I mean, at that time it felt like it was kind of old and ending, but that was mm -hmm. 10 years ago. I actually started my <laughs> blog 10 years ago this month. Um, wow. And so I started the blog 
while I was still working at the restaurant because I had, I was just so passionate. I had all of these ideas that I wanted to explore that kind of didn't really fit with what we were doing at the restaurant. Mm -hmm. And I started the blog. Um, I started, I didn't start shooting my blog on film, but like a few months into it, I switched to shooting it entirely on film. And I just felt really, it was so, I just got, it was just this beautiful creative project that I got so into. Um, And I ended up getting some attention for the blog. Um, It was a lot easier to stand out there then because there were just fewer people doing it. And what I was doing was pretty unique in the grand scheme. Um, And then I started the blog, I got some attention for the blog. And then I ended up getting through the, and then like further through the blog, I learned about this whole food media world that existed, um, which I didn't really know about before. Like I had always consumed it. I had always read magazines and watched food TV, but I never really thought about how those things were made. And since so many of those things are made in New York, I started realizing, oh, there's like a person who only makes the food and that person's called a food stylist. And there's a person who chooses all the plates and flatware and that person is called a prop stylist and there's a photographer. And um, I learned about all of these food media jobs that I didn't really understand existed. And, you know, the people writing the recipes and the people editing the recipes and cre- coming up with creative concepts. There's this, this whole universe of food media that I think people are a lot more aware of now. Um, but when I was, you know, when I was just starting out, I didn't know. So I learned about this this world of food media and I kind of decided that that was gonna be my next um, step. And I started um, looking up food stylists and looking up photographers and sending out like 1 million emails. Like, do you need anyone to help you? I would happy to be a free assistant for you. Or, you know, do you need, I would love to work with you and learn from you and, you know, teach me your ways. Um, and I got very few responses, but I got a few responses and I, um, started assisting people and I started working in food media in that way. And also during that time I had been approached about doing a book. And so I was writing the book and then everything just kind of started snowballing it at once. So, um, that kind of gets me to where I am today started. And so I, yeah, so the. The, my first book came out in 2016 um, and my blog also won a big award that year when like the silver blog awards which was a huge platform um, and was something that kind of propelled me in a way that was that made it um, like profitable for me to do sponsored content and stuff so I was able to uh, leave the bakery focus on blogging and my own personal projects and writing the book and styling and doing sponsored content and all of those things all kind of mashed together, um, which is what I still do. It's just like a huge combination of a bunch of different stuff. That's awesome. I love how, um, not that you couldn't like have ended up in this point in a different way, but kind of like that one moment of like, or like those couple moments of like, hmm, like I'm not really feeling living with my parents forever. I think I'm going to move to New York (laughs) or like, hmm, I really hate being receptionist. Like, let me just like go see if I can work in the kitchen and then like, however many years later, like here you are, you know, blogger and published author. And it's just like, those moments are just funny that, that take you in a direction like towards your, your, where you're supposed to be. Yeah. And it definitely like felt like it all happened really fast and really naturally, but like I've lived in New York for 13 years. <laughs> like I've been doing it for 13 years. Yeah. Um, so it's been a long journey to kind of get where I am today. Awesome. Um, okay, so I want to, now I want to get into the book a little bit. So first of all, tell us, what is a snacking cake? What makes a cake a snacking cake? Well, there's a saying that any cake can be a snack, but a <laughs> snacking cake for me and for like the purpose of the book, a snacking cake is a, it's a single layer cake. It's easy to make. It doesn't have, it has like a very simple topping, but like lots of the cakes in the book have no topping at all. And like all of the toppings are optional. So like there's a few um, frostings that you can make with like an electric hand mixer, but everything else is just a glaze that you can whisk together by hand or, um, you know, a confectioner sugar sprinkle. So they're really simple cakes. They're very easy to make. You don't need a lot of equipment to make them. They, most of them, are um, tends to be like 
I mean, it's all cake, so it's all sweet, but like I tried to kind of keep the sugar on the low end where possible. So like you could feel virtuous eating it for breakfast or lunch or snack or dinner or whatever. It's just a cake that it keeps for a long time. It's easy to make. It's a single layer. You don't have to mess up your whole kitchen to do it. And if you have like a reasonably stocked baking pantry, you probably have everything that you already need to make one or 10 of the cakes that are in the book right now. I love that for so many reasons. Like number one, I love you encouraging us to eat cake for breakfast. I, I can totally get behind that move. And second of all, as somebody who's not like a hardcore baker, like occasionally I will like pull out all the steps and make something like intense. But I love the idea of just like opening your pantry and being like, okay, what are we gonna whip up today? I love it. Yeah, it's um, like, it doesn't require an occasion. It's just a cake because you feel like having some cake, which is a, yes. a lot of the time for me, especially but, right now. That is a very good reason to have cake. Yeah. Um, oh, and okay. they're usually, I saw someone poke in the chat. They're usually um, square made in an eight by eight pan. So every cake in the book can be made in an eight by eight pan, um, but I give lots of variations. You can also make every cake in a nine, a nine inch round pan. The volume is almost identical, or you could, make it in a loaf pan or nine by 13 doubling it. So, but traditionally a snacking cake is a square. Cool, thank you. Um, so this is a similar question. So what was the inspiration for the book? Why were you like, I'm gonna develop 50 snacking cake recipes? Like, do you just love snacking cakes? Or like, did you want to do, cause it's a bit different from your first book, Sweeter Off the Vine, which is awesome. Um, yeah. But a little bit more accessible. Like what was, why did you decide you wanted to go in this direction? Yeah, the first book was like, felt very epic to me. It was like this beautiful seasonal exploration of um, of fruit and it was packed full of tons and tons of photography and I got to like really go wild. Um, but I kind of, I knew that for my second book or for my next book, I wanted to kind of focus on something a little more contained and a little bit simpler. Um, I am like, a very lazy cook and I have turned into kind of a lazy baker. I'm not, I'm just like, I'm not making layer cakes and, you know, intricate stuff right now. And even, you know, two years ago, I, you know, I kind of wasn't doing that. So I had a bunch of kind of half done proposals of like easy baking, one bowl baking, just like a lot of like that kind of stuff in that genre um, kind of floating around in my mind. And I was, uh, actually like approached by my editor and, and she said, what about a bowl that, or what about a book that's only cakes, really simple cakes, really like no nonsense, fun, easy recipes. And I was like, yes, that's like all of the thoughts that I have going on all <laughs> like smashed into like an actual concept. That was <laughs> something yeah. that I could follow through on and finish. Um, okay. So it was something that was kind of floating around in my mind and then something that um, my editor really pushed forward and I'm so glad that she did because this is like the most fun, fun, fun project. That's awesome. That's how you know you have a good editor. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay. And then what you kind of like kept it under wraps a little bit. You kind of like pulled a Beyonce on us. Like you didn't mention like on social at all that you're writing. You're like, boom, guess what? I it's wrote done. a book. <laughs> Was that like from the editor? Or was that from you like to keep pressure off? Or like, what was that about? It was definitely from me. I, um, I just kind of wanted to, to do it and just like, you know, just drop it like done. Like, guess what? Guess what I did? Here's the cover. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, I just, I don't know. I kind of had gotten a little bit of, I think, fatigue of like promoting like self-promotion fatigue and I didn't I didn't want to be talking about it for a long time I just wanted yeah. to be talking about it when it was really done and I had like had something to show for it and so that's what I did okay I like I was just like so surprised I was like what I had no idea she's writing a book <laughs> like here it is boom um so tell us a little bit about the process. Okay, so how, I would love to hear like how long, you mentioned like two years ago, like from the time that your editor approached you, how long did it take you to like conceptualize it, develop the recipes and shoot it? Like what was that process like? And did you like shoot it as you go or did you develop all the recipes and then you went in the studio and shot everything in like a week? How did, how did it go down? 
Yeah, I I had been kind of floating my own ideas around for quite a while. And then um, a little bit over a year ago, I nailed down the concept with the editor um, and wrote the book and like developed all of the recipes, tested all of the recipes. And then we shot it, um, like I was always gonna shoot it myself, but I knew like my first book I shot entirely by myself, no assistance, no stylists, no help whatsoever. And I shot it over kind of a long period of time. Um, and I love the photography in the book and, um, and I loved doing it that way. And I was able to shoot it seasonally, which was really, really important uh, for the look of the book. <clears throat> but for this one, like I knew that I didn't like, I just didn't want to take all that time. I didn't want to shoot and develop at the same time. So I did the whole, like the whole, I wrote the whole book um, and then I turned it in. And so, and then I decided that I wanted to put together just kind of a small crew to help me. Um, I, so I hired uh, an assist, a baking assistant. Uh, the first day I had two assistants and then um, Ali Slagle, who is like a prop and food stylist. And so she was able, and we have worked together quite a bit. So she was able to kind of like channel my thoughts through her thoughts, cause we just work together really well. Um, it's kind of hard for me to work with other people on my own projects because I am used to doing everything, but like it takes a really long time and it's not very efficient. Mm -hmm. So I knew that I, I knew that I could have someone else bake the cakes and I could just work with Allie to figure out the propping and everything. Um, and we shot 50, we shot the 50 recipes over the course of five days in the studio. Um, I was able to use my friend Peter's studio in Williamsburg, which is now closed um, because of the pandemic, but it was a beautiful studio and I couldn't have, I was originally planning to do it in my apartment, which is like a totally insane <laughs> thing to conceptualize once we got into the studio and had like 10 six foot folding tables full of stuff, which um, would not have fit in my apartment mm -hmm. um, and would have made our lives in my apartment very hard for a long time. Um, so I'm very thankful that I was able to shoot it in the studio and I shot it uh, almost entirely with artificial light because it was um, the first week of February and it was dark at four o'clock in the afternoon. So like natural light was just not an option for the shoot. Um, and so we did that, we shot, we shot all of the cakes and then I ended up doing another couple days of pickup shots at home by myself of stuff that like, I just wanted to tweak slightly because we were moving so fast in the studio um, that like, sometimes I kind of don't know what I want until I see everything together and then I'm like, I wish that this one was a little bit lighter because it's gonna, you know, there are gonna be so many dark ones in a row. And I, cause we had a, we were able to have like a flat, a flat plan of the book before we went to shoot. So I could see mm -hmm. the layouts, which was oh, um, cool. really helpful. Cause I don't, yeah. if you've looked at the book, a lot of the photos have text on them. Mm -hmm. And that was really challenging to shoot around. Um, but if we hadn't had that flat plan with all the kind of text on it already, I would have probably had to reshoot everything because you don't, you kind of don't think to leave so much extra space when you're shooting photos. Yeah. Um, yeah, so we shot it over the course of a week and then I did a, a few pickup shots afterwards. Um, yeah, and I was able to borrow beautiful ceramics from uh, a number of people from Candace Bowes, from Bo Rush and from Mylan Ceramics. And then Falcon Enamelware also donated a bunch of stuff that we could that we were able to use. And I raided my own um, my own prop closet and my own ceramics. And Allie brought a bunch of stuff, and we were able to use stuff at the studio. So it was like a real hodgepodge that I think ended up looking really nice. Oh, and I brought a bunch of um, cooling racks and sifters from Erin Clark's in Cody Kitchen. She has an amazing prop closet that she very generously let me raid. The props are beautiful. I was like drooling over the ceramics and the surfaces in the book. It's gorgeous. Yeah. Um, and so, and like, what about the process of testing? Like, did all of your neighbors like put on five pounds while you were shooting the book? Like, oh my gosh. Yes. 
I made, <laughs> I have photos of like my entire kitchen counter covered with like two layers of cake. It wasn't just like one thing. It was like stacked up and up and up. Um, and I, you know, I had my like round of people that I would call like, I got a bunch of cake. You want some cake? Can I give you some cake? I'm going to drop some cake off at your house. I'm going to push it through the mail slot and run away <laughs> uh, because people stopped accepting it, frankly. <laughs> it was wow. a lot of cake. So and like I, like, at first I was like keeping it a lot in my freezer and then eventually it was like the freezer's full so I don't I can't keep anymore I was like I gotta get you guys you gotta take the cake like you mm -hmm. have to take it so I just wrap it up for my neighbors and like put two on their doorstep and run away like secret secret cake network I'm sure it like spread out through the city to people's workplaces and... yeah I need to expand my cake network so you know if anyone is in uh the North Brooklyn area next time I'm testing I'm dropping stuff off at your house <laughs> Um, what else do I want to ask you about? Um, oh, I want to talk about, let's talk about fruit because the first chapter of the book is about fruit and your first book is about, um, fruit based desserts. So let's talk about like this love of fruit. Where does this come from? Do you have a favorite fruit? Like what's the deal? Yeah. Well, you know that cause you live there, but the Pacific Northwest, Northwest, I think has some of the best fruit in the whole country, except for maybe California, which I'm not super familiar with, but I know that California like hits the stone fruit out of the park. Um, but I, I grew up, you know, in Seattle picking blackberries every summer and my parents always had fruit trees and raspberries in the backyard and they shipped me a box of quince every fall. Um, so it's always just been something that's been part of our family's life. like celebrating gardening the seasons and you know stopping on the side of the road if we see something that's on public property that looks good you know we'll go shake some mulberries out of a tree or grab a couple of figs um and I think what like when I started baking more and started blogging more I started to really gravitate towards fruit because it's so beautiful and it's so fun to photograph um and I was really experimenting with my photography and having so much fun like going out into the field and going my parents have a, a plot in the picardo pea patch near you prep and i don't know if, if you live in seattle and you live anywhere near there just walking through that place in the summer is incredible just like so many varieties of of berries so many beautiful flowers so many beautiful gardens so many delicious looking things to see and to and to photograph and so that's where i really I really started focusing on fruit and also because it's so delicious and so satisfying and the, and the flavors and the colors and everything together is just just so beautiful and so attractive to me um and also i think one thing that i love about fruit desserts is that um they can be they can be really tart like you can you can have a really delicious fruit pie that's like not overly sweet and then you put some ice cream on it and it's like this perfect balance so fruit desserts always to me always were like the most balanced because um fruit naturally has like a tartness and acidity to it um so that's that's just that's my fave <laughs> um yeah the the fruit desserts in here are gorgeous but i was actually really impressed that like I think chocolate cakes are super hard to shoot and make like a, appealing and like the, I'll just take a minute to show people like the chocolate cakes in here, the chapter on chocolate cakes I was very impressed that like you were able to make chocolate cake which tastes amazing but which doesn't always look so beautiful just like gorgeous. Thank you. Oh. That was um, the chocolate cake was the, the chocolate chapter was definitely the hardest to write. Um, one of my goals with the book is because I think so visually and from the, the like very moment I started developing the recipes, even like just developing the concepts, I knew that I wanted all of the cakes to look different. I wanted all 50 to look different. I knew that was going to be really challenging because like cake is brown. Mm -hmm. It's just varying <laughs> shades of brown. And I was like, I cannot shoot 50 brown cakes. I do not know how to make that appealing at all. And so it was definitely part of the process to make everything beautiful and appealing and different from one another. And the chocolate chapter was the hardest. And also like just making um, so many chocolate cakes that tasted different was really tricky without just like, I didn't wanna just like swap out the topping. I wanted to really make them unique and stand out. Um, 
and I think that was pretty successful. That's like the, the wackiest, I think the wackiest cake is in that chapter, which is the um, chocolate and beet cake, which is not oh, like yes. a, like chocolate beet cake has existed in a lot of forms, but usually it uses beet puree. And um, this was not a book that was gonna call for beet puree. Yeah, and here's so, the picture if you guys wanna see it. Like, yeah. So yeah, so you actually, for that cake, you just grate the beets um, on a box grater and they melt into the batter really beautifully and make it a really nice texture. And then you use a little grated beet in the glaze, which makes it like this crazy hot pink color. Just so cool. So pretty. And it's delicious. It has orange zest and poppy seeds and all kinds of fun stuff. Well, that brings, okay, that is a really good segue to my next question. And I just want to, I see some people asking questions in the chat. So please, if you could copy your questions over to the Q&A and we will get to them at the end. I just want to make sure we get to your questions. Um, but that segues into my next question for you, Yasi, which is like, how do you get inspiration? Like, the, first of all, this like crazy, like chocolate beet business or like some of the combos in here, I was like, what? Like, where, where's your biggest sources of inspiration? Um, there's this book called The Flavor Thesaurus that's very cool mm -hmm. that like, yeah, it's just, uh, it's a book that, you know, shows, and there's also another book called The Flavor Bible, which is kind of similar, which just kind of lists an ingredient and all of the possible things that could like taste great with that ingredient. So I kind of, I have always just flipped through those books casually. Um, and when I was brainstorming for the book, I just kind of wrote down every combination of ingredients that sounded interesting and delicious to me. Um, I always in, you know, in my baking, I always strive to um, make the recipes taste balanced. And for fruitcakes, that's really easy because, you know, fruit generally, except for something like a banana has like some natural tartness. So when you mix it with sugar and fat into a cake, like you naturally have some balance. And I wanted to kind of extend that balance through the rest of the recipes. So that meant to me like matching the sweetness of cake with spice or with toasty nuts or toasty butter or chocolate, which is naturally bitter and then balancing the bitterness of the chocolate with something sweet, like sweetened nutty peanut butter or um, uh, there's like, you know, and then there's also like some natural, like well-loved flavor combinations like chocolate and mint or um, chocolate and peanut butter. You know, that one's uh, like close to my yeah, heart. It's so <laughs> I love good. chocolate. And that has like, you know, it's not just a chocolate cake with peanut butter on top. It's a chocolate cake that has peanut butter in the actual cake batter. And then there's a peanut butter glaze on top. So if you just want to have a chocolate peanut butter experience like you don't even have to make the glaze that goes on top because the cake already has both um so yeah I always just kind of like search for things that are are balanced I think that's like my number one goal with recipes is like have a couple of flavors but not like 30 flavors and have them marry really well that answers a question. Another question I was going to ask is like these, I think they have just the right amount of complexity, the recipes in here. And I was kind of going to ask about that process. Like, how do you know when to stop? And it looks like you're just like looking for like balance, you know, because some people cook like over the top, like it's like a crazy unicorn, like a cake with all these crazy ingredients. But it sounds like you're just looking to find that, like just to make your recipes like balanced and accessible. Yeah, I had in my mind, I had like the base, the base ingredients um, that were kind of like gimmies, which were like, you know, flour, sugar, uh, dairy, eggs, um, and salt, basically. And then when I was adding flavors, I tried to only add like two or three things, not like seven things. So if I was adding, like, I really wanted to do a plum cake in the book, because I love plums, I see it open on your desk. And I was like, well, what can I, like, what's oh, one fun. thing that I can pair with plums that's really delicious? And I was like, plums and almond is so nice together. Like, let's make a kind of, let's take this cake base that I've created, add some almond flour. So it has like a little bit more chewiness and like a little bit of a nubbly texture. And we'll just nestle the plums into that. And then let's put something like crunchy on top. So it's, you have like the juiciness of the plums, the chewiness of the cake, and then let's put some almonds on top so it's also crunchy and beautiful so it'll be nice to photograph and nice to eat um so like 
that's kind of the process that I went through with all of the cakes. And some of them, some of them are also very simple. There's just like also a very simple um, chocolate cake that's made with yogurt, but the yogurt adds a little bit of tanginess. It gives the cake this wonderful, fluffy, soft texture. So you have this bitter chocolate cake that's sweet, but since it has like the background note of the yogurt, it kind of like is a little more exciting. Um, and it doesn't need anything on top if you don't want to. You can just eat it just like it is. Yeah, I love that about the book that you have. Like not only you can cook in all the different kinds of cake pans, like loaf, bun, you know, like uh, square, round, but also there's um, a lot of variations for glazes and like the flavored whipped creams. I'm very into that. I'm going to try some of those out. Oh yeah, um, the chocolate ones so are really good. Okay, awesome. So this is a good time to ask. Somebody had a question about your favorite fruit and spice combo. Any like, I know you love plums, but are there any particular like fruit and spice that you love together? Um, I really love using allspice in like a, an applesauce cake or a pumpkin cake. It has kind of a, um, almost like a savoriness that some of the other like sweet spices like cinnamon and nutmeg don't have. Um, so mm -hmm. I love sneaking like a little bit of, of allspice or pepper into to fruit cakes. I think it just gives them like a little pop. Yeah, no, I love that. I love black pepper in cakes too. Um, so, okay, we're talking about your inspiration, ideas for recipes. Do you have any favorite bakers that you want to share? Any favorite people that you follow that you get inspiration from? Like anybody that we should know about? Like who, who do you love? My like all-time favorite cookbooks are <clears throat> by Alice Medrich and um, by um, Kim Boyce, Good to the Green is such an incredible book that inspires me so much still. And I think it came out like maybe 10 years ago and it might be out of print. Um, she runs a bake shop in Portland and I think it's called Bake Shop PDX maybe. But that's what the Instagram is called. I'm not sure what the shop is called. Um, and then I think like online, there are so many bloggers that are such amazing bakers that do like really beautiful and simple things. Um, Cloudy Kitchen does beautiful like macaron and stuff that I find really inspiring that maybe I would never actually make myself. Um, <laughs> um, and Adriana from Cozy Kitchen does really beautiful baking. Um, I think that like bloggers are really like pushing the envelope of of baking. Um, and I love seeing like people on Instagram, like totally go crazy. Even if I know that I would never like go crazy the way they do, I think it's really fun. Um, and then I also love um, Nicole Rucker. She has a shop in LA called Fat and Flour. That's really wonderful. Mm -hmm. um, there's, you know, so many bread bakers on Instagram. Um, Artisan Brian, Brian Ford is so great. Uh, I don't know, there's so many. There's like overwhelming number of bakers that online that are doing such cool stuff and in person. Yes, people are killing it it's so much. And even if like people are cooking like super over the top, I always feel like I'll take a little bit from here, a little bit from there and just like yeah, you can like in. You can like, it like see the flavor combination. Like, oh, I would have never thought to put those two things together. Like, yeah. And Lara, and I just wanted to point out to everybody that Lara has put in the chat links for the flavor Bible. She says, unfortunately, good to the grain is indeed out of print. Um, there's a link for Nicole Rucker. So just watch the chat for links to some of those books. Um, how much time do we have? A little more time before we go to questions. Oh, and that new Baking from the 20th Century Cafe book. Oh boy, that is incredible. Okay, awesome. I don't have that, so I'll have to check it out. Yeah. Um, let's see. Okay, two questions that I definitely want to get to, or three questions I definitely want to get to before we stop. I always have to ask everybody this, like, if you have to choose among your your babies, like, what is, do you have a favorite recipe from the book? If you could only choose one. Only one. You know, I really love that cocoa yogurt cake. Like, I think it's, like, it's my chocolate cake now. It's just a really simple, really good um, really soft chocolate cake. A lot of the, most of the cakes in the book have like a very soft texture, which is on purpose. Um, that was kind of just what I was going for, just like really melt in your mouth textures. So everybody, here's a picture yeah. of this gorgeous cake. It's, it's actually, it's the, it's the cover girl. Um, it has oh, yeah. a vanilla bean glaze on it in the cover, on the cover. And then with the recipe also, there's um, 
a cocoa glaze that's really delicious and easy and like shiny and beautiful. Like it's prettier than frosting, I think. Um, but it's also just great by itself. And there's some chocolate folded into it, but like a lot of times I make it without the chocolate folded in because it's just such a nice, it's just nice to have that like nice soft chocolatey cake. And it's still very rich. Um, I use Dutch processed cocoa in all of the recipes just because I think it tastes really good. And mm -hmm. when the, um, you know, I thought since all of our ingredients lists in these recipes are really short though, you know, using that Dutch processed cocoa makes a really big difference in the like rich chocolatey flavor. Okay, good to know. You've sold me. I'm not a huge chocolate cake person, but I will try it. <laughs> yeah, I kind of wasn't either, but like, I'm pretty, like that was, you know, it was the hardest chapter, but I really ended up liking a lot of the chocolate cakes. Okay, awesome. I will, I will bake it. Um, and then another question I absolutely wanted to get to was like your number one piece of advice for like new bakers or novice bakers. Number one piece of advice is to not panic. And that's, like, don't freak out. It's just baking. If you're just starting out, don't start out by making a 12 layer cake with two different fillings and a frosting. Like <laughs> start out with something that's simple, make a, you know, a batch of brownies, make a one bowl cake, um, make things that are less complicated and build up to it. Cause if you start with something that's like way beyond your skill level, you're like, I mean, I would freak out if I was making something way beyond my skill level and I, was like afraid to mess up at every turn. Um, so like start with something easy and don't worry if you mess up. Cause like, it's just cake. It's just brownies. It's not a big deal. Have fun. Ooh, if yeah, it's have fun. really bad, just put some ice cream on top of it. It's fine. You'll fix it. Ice cream fixes everything. <laughs> yeah. Some whipped cream on it. Close your eyes. It's fine. <laughs> a lot of things like, even if they don't look great when you bake them still taste very good. That's very true. Um, and then just, I want to ask you like one technique question and then we'll go to the Q and A, but kind of, this is like two technique questions in one. So the technique in the book, just to make this, they're super simple, one bowl cakes, you need to only need a whisk. You don't need a stand mix or anything. So you start mm -hmm. out with the sugar, with the eggs to kind of like start dissolving the sugar. I just was curious, what is the difference like texture wise, or is there a big difference between cake recipes where you cream the sugar with the butter, which is how almost all of my cake recipes that I bake from start out with? Yeah, there, so when, like when you make a cake with the creaming method, which starts with like softened butter, and sugar, you're um, you're dissolving the sugar sugar into the butter, but you're also creating some air um, in in the butter. You're creating some lift, and then you add eggs and you whip the eggs, and that creates some more lift. So those cakes are um, the texture of the crumb is a little bit different. It can be it can be a little bit lighter than the, these cakes. Um, these cakes are all made with melted butter or oil. Um, or liquid coconut oil. So, and they're all just whisked together really easily. And all of the leavening, all of the rides in the cakes comes from the baking soda and baking powder. But when you make a cake with a cream, with like the creaming method, um, some of the lift, excuse me, some of the lift in the cake comes from creating air through mixing the butter and sugar together and the eggs. And it will give you a slightly different finished texture of the cake for sure. And then you also, you talked about the cakes are made with oil versus butter. And is that like a, f I mean, part of that is flavor, but they have a different fat content. So like, how did you choose when to use, talk about oil versus butter? Yeah, oil cakes. Um, oil is great for a cake, like a snacking cake, because it helps it stay moist for days and days and days. Like on the second day, a cake made with oil is probably going to like be more moist than on the first day. Um, and so... A lot of the cakes use oil for that reason. And a lot of the cakes use oil for flavor. Like I use olive oil quite a bit. Um, and some of the cakes use butter and the butter is um, for flavor. And it like, it just, butter tastes really good. And um, a lot of the times when I'm making a cake recipe, I'll use both butter and oil. But for these cakes, I wanted to just kind of stick with one, with one fat, I think pretty sure pretty sure that they all use just one or the other um and it's just for for flavor purposes and also to you know give like some options for people i know lots of people are dairy free and so the cakes made with oil are naturally dairy free and you don't have to make any swaps um because i get questions a lot about making swaps and i think 
oil cakes still, I mean, taste delicious even without that extra flavor from the butter. Okay, cool. Thank you for clearing that up. Um, okay, let's get into, so we have about 15 minutes left. So let's get in some, into some of your questions, everybody. So Abby Schachter, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, asks, what is the most unusual or exciting ingredient or technique you used in this book? Ooh. I'm just gonna turn I don't know if there are any like wow ingredients. I feel like everyone kind of has a little bit of a more global pantry than they used to. Um, so I grew up eating things you know, eating tahini and eating dates and eating sumac and all of those ingredients. And so they're very familiar to me. Um, but I do, like I use a, there's a rhubarb, there's a crumb cake in the book, which is one of the only cakes that you'll need a second bowl for to make the crumb topping. Um, and it's a rhubarb cake with a crumb topping that has some sumac in it, which is like this beautiful tart and kind of fruity note to in the crumb topping. So that might be the most unusual one but it's something that's not unusual to me because I kind of grew up eating it. Mm -hmm. I saw that. I was like, oh, what an interesting combo. I would have never thought about. Yeah. Um, let's see, Gay Jensen asks, can whole wheat pastry flour be substituted in all recipes? Oh, wait, no, oops, questions just moved around. Can whole wheat pastry flour be substituted in all recipes in the book if you're trying to avoid white flour? Ooh, you know, I think, I'm not sure. I, when I'm baking with whole grain flours, even if it is a pastry flour texture, I tend to only use like up to about half. So like that's where my kind of experience ends. But if you've had good experience baking with whole wheat pastry flour, like if you swap it in other recipes, um, in these cakes, I think it would be just fine. The cakes are like, as I said, they're very moist. They're, there's a lot of good, delicious flavors. And I think um, in a lot of them, whole grain flour would actually add, add really nice extra flavor. I love baking with whole grains. So I think it would probably be okay. I haven't tried it, so I can't say for sure, but I think it'll probably be okay. Okay, cool. Um, next question. Julia Thompson asks, how many pounds, how many pounds of flour did you go through in the testing for snacking cakes? Any idea? I would say 15 to 20 pounds a week Ooh, for a couple wow. of months. Maybe not that of, much. It's a lot of flour. It was a lot. I lost track. <laughs> um, Karen Hernandez asks, says, hello, I have a question. Do you like your fruit cakes? Well, fruit cakes or chocolate cakes better if you had to choose? Fruit. Fruit. That's like- More that's There's a, just like a wider variety, I think, of flavors. Adria Katka asks, uh, you've mentioned fruit and chocolate. How did you- uh, how did you categorize the cakes and finalize the recipe list? Yeah, like how did you choose the different categories? Did that kind of happen as you went or did you know before you started? Um, I kind of knew before I started. Um, I knew there was gonna be a chapter that was focused on fruit cakes because they're my first love. And I knew that like chocolate is a big crowd pleaser and so I would have to make a bunch of chocolate cakes for chocolate fans. Um, and then kind of in the middle, there were all these other flavors that I, that kind of, you know, the cakes that had, you know, toasty nuts or spices or herbs, um, those ended all ended up all kind of getting added together into that warm and cozy chapter, which is the middle chapter. Um, and then I didn't know where to put my vanilla cakes because they didn't really seem like they fit in any of those categories. And so they got their own little special shout out at the end. So it's yeah, not a like full chapter. I like the, the vanilla chapters all like mix and match, which is so, I'll show you guys. Yeah, there's like, a, the base cake is a really delicious um, vanilla buttermilk cake that like tastes like box cake mix in the best possible way. And then mm -hmm. I give you some options to kind of switch up the flavor a little bit. You can add malt powder, you can add sprinkles, you can top it with a strawberry buttercream, you can chop it with glaze or vanilla buttercream. So I also tried to give a lot of variations in the book. Um, so it's 50 base recipes, but it's probably like four times that if you add in all the variations. If you mix all the glazes and toppings. Yeah. Um, okay, Teresa Mullen asks, how did you, oh yeah, how did you pick the cover photo with so many photos taken? Did you choose, did the editor choose? How did you get there? 
Um, we had a couple of concepts. They So I turned in all of the photos from um, that five day shoot that we had and they had pulled a few, they had kind of pulled a few ideas um, before the shoot even happened of like concepts that they kind of wanted to try. And so we tried some of those concepts and then they saw the photos from the shoot and they ended up really liking um, the photo of the cocoa yogurt cake. And so um, I ended up reshooting it. I remade it and I reshot it specifically for the cover. And then the photo that's on the, like this first page, this was almost the cover shot. Mm. They wanted to try it. We almost did like a cool, like full bleed kind of photo for the cover, but we ended up settling on what's on the cover with my with my hand sneaking a piece. So pretty. They're both really pretty. Um, okay, Lars Wilka has a great question. I'm glad you asked this, Lars, because it was in my list too. So in trying to escape from current events, I decided to jump into holiday baking planning a bit early. Are there any recipes in the book that stand out to you as particularly good for any of the upcoming holidays? Ooh. Um, I just made the pumpkin olive oil cake. It has a maple and olive oil glaze on it, which is very good and I think would be very nice for any fall holiday. The glaze is like, it's just really interesting. It kind of has a savoriness from the olive oil and a, like the rich maple sweetness is just so nice. And then the cake has some black pepper and it has some allspice. So it's like a really nice spicy pumpkin cake with a really cool topping. It's so pretty. I'm just trying to find a picture of it really quickly. Yeah. And then um, for like more of a winter holiday, like the minty chocolate malt cake, I think is also very tasty. For more it's a like pumpkin. A, yeah. Oil cake. Yeah, we shot it as a loaf for the, um, for the book. Awesome. The texture of that glaze is also very good. It's also like that glaze would be good on any like apple cake. It would be good on any spice cake. It's really, it's one of my favorites very silky. Cool, that's beautiful. Um, Kelly, wait, did I, no, I skipped. Oh yeah, Karen Hernandez. What other desserts besides cake do you like to bake? Any other favorites? Um, I really like to make pie. Pie is one of my first cake loves. Um, and I love galettes because they're easier than pie, but you get like the buttery crust and the juicy fruit and all that together. Um, but yeah, I've really been gravitating, gravitating towards easy, easy recipes. Like I don't want to get my mixer out. I don't want to have to make three separate things. Like I just want to make one thing. <laughs> it's so perfect for quarantine baking. It's like true comfort baking. Like not only is the, yeah. result, the finished result comforting, just the process of like, I can just do this easily. I don't have to kill myself. Um, Definitely. Great question. Let's see, Kelly Arafi asks, how long have you been baking? Did you bake with your parents as a child? Hi, Kelly. Kelly is my sister-in-law. <laughs> um, yeah, I've, we baked together a lot. My mom used to make, um, we made blackberry pie every summer. And I think we did like a lot of, I always loved, cooking it was just always something that I really enjoyed and she bought me like the Mrs. Fields cookie book I think at TJ Maxx or something <laughs> and I think I cooked every cookie in the Mrs. Fields cookie book um and yeah we you know we cooked together a lot as a family awesome um Teresa Mullen asks how does the virtual book tour compare to traditional book tours work out better question mark yeah, this is my first event. Um, but yeah, I think it's nice because you get to talk to people in a really wide range of places. You know, they don't have to physically be where you are. And book touring now is so tricky. I mean, now in this moment, but like even before this exact moment, book touring is hard because it's expensive and um, it's a lot of, you know, it's a lot of time to travel and it's really wonderful to meet people, but also kind of nice to meet people from your home and you can meet more of them at once. I think, you know, people from all over the world can tune into this. So that's awesome. Yeah, it's very cool. I wonder if like the future of book tours after this is all over is will be like a kind of blended like in person because it is cool yeah. to meet somebody in person, but then also with combined with like virtual talks. Yeah, I think uh, it just opens it up to a much wider audience, which is great. Yes. 
Um, we have a question from Julia Thompson about your favorite recipe with almonds. Ooh. In the book, that plum and almond cake is so tasty. Um, I love baking with almond flour because it kind of makes cakes like chewy, gives it a chewy texture. Um, mm -hmm. And I love that recipe a lot. Cool. Um, let's see. Lars has another question. Are ingredient quantities in the book listed by weight or volume? Both. Yay. <laughs> Cups and grams. Everything that's smaller than a quarter cup has a weight or larger than a quarter cup has a weight measurement as well. Also awesome. the leavening and stuff is still um, teaspoons and tablespoons. Um, somebody asks, um, what's your favorite recipe? Um, Kelly asks, what's your favorite recipe you have made out of this new cookbook from Olivia and Sophia? Olivia and Sophia are my nieces. They're so <laughs> sweet, hello. Well, the cake that they liked the best was the um, almond butter banana cake, which mm. is very cool. It's very like, it's a like nice twist on banana bread. Use a little bit of um, unsweetened uh, natural almond butter in there. It gives it a really great flavor. Yum. Oh, this is a great question from Catherine Zwack. Were there recipes that you were sad to leave out? I was surprised to not see your pumpkin sheet cake with molasses cream cheese frosting. Yeah, yeah, I didn't, um, all the recipes are new, so I didn't reuse any recipes that I written for other things, um, but there was a chocolate and, and prune cake that just didn't make the cut. <laughs> it was a, the, the prunes were a hard sell. <laughs> oh, okay, <laughs> you just have to call them like the French, like just dried plums. <laughs> yeah, I know, I know. There's, I think, and there were a couple of more that have like, that have, that are gone from my mind, but I kind of overshot. I think I developed like 53 or 54 recipes um, and I kind of tossed them to my editors and said, what do you guys think? And I think we all, I think we ended up all agreeing on the ones that needed to, um, to go. but maybe I'll publish the chocolate prune cake on my blog someday if anyone's yes. interested. <laughs> I'm interested. I like prunes. Yeah. Um, I Jessica like prunes too. They're so good. Yes. Um, Jessica Canfield, oh, hi, Jessica, asks, which recipe are you most proud of? Oh, wow. Honestly, like, I love them all so much. I'm mostly proud that I was able to write 51 bowl recipes that are all delicious <laughs> and all that all look different. Yes, such a feat. Like, they, and they really do look different. Like, yeah, I would not have thought you would be able to get such variety in, like, snacking cakes. Um, oh, here's one from Caroline Saunders. Is there a cake in the book that reminds you of Seattle or the Pacific Northwest? And that could help me get through the rainy dark season. Um, gosh, what would remind me the most? I don't know, I think maybe the, like the berry cakes remind me most of the Pacific Northwest just because the berries in the Pacific Northwest are so good. Um, but through for the rainy, oh, sorry, my dog's coming over. <laughs> dog, dog cameo. Um, for the rainy <laughs> months, I would definitely choose something citrusy, like the lemon olive oil cake or the um, orange poppy seed cake. Those, you know, we all need a little citrus on those rainy days for brightness. Yes, that like brightness in the middle of winter. And we have a lot more questions, but I'm just gonna choose a couple more. Um, Natasha Umar. Hi, Natasha. Hi, Natasha. Um, she writes, any, plan any plans for doing additional workshops whenever we can travel again? Yeah, I want to know this too. <laughs> <laughs> Someday if we can ever travel again. Yes, I know. Yes. Yasi and I have done a couple, a couple, two or three workshops together in Paris. Three, yeah. I can't remember. Three. And well, I is so the much best I think Paris guide in the whole world. She took oh. a city that I was very ambivalent about and made me feel very warm feelings about it. So I love Paris now because of the <laughs> Oh, I didn't know that. That makes me feel so good. Um, so hopefully, fingers crossed. Whew, fingers crossed on so many levels right now, but we're not going to get into that. Um, all your fingers and toes. <laughs> um, OK, let's just take two more questions. Um, 
Oh, yes. Here's a good one. Stacy York asks, what do you have planned for your next book? Pies, galettes, cookies? Is there a next book? When is the next book? Tell us everything. I don't know. I just finished <laughs> this one. Um, yes, I would love to do another one. I'm really enjoying this like easy baking thing that I've got going. So if I can translate that to another topic, I think I'd really like to do that. Um, I do have really enjoyed like writing a baking book that's pretty contained. Like the first one was all fruit desserts, which kind of was a big range of, ended up being a big range of different sorts of, sorts of things, like all tied together under that fruit umbrella. Um, but I loved being able to just like focus on one topic and explore that topic in a bunch of different ways. So I think I'll probably do something like that again. I'm not entirely sure what that will be. If you have any good ideas, let okay. me know. Okay, yeah, drop it in the comments, you guys, if you have good ideas. Um, I'm gonna take two more. So, oh, this is a question. Lisa Young Love, Young Love asks, can I use frozen berries in the berry cakes? I think a few recipes specified fresh, but hoping to use frozen. Yeah, I always, I never know exactly when you can use berries, but I don't know, like to use them out of season. So what do you recommend? I think frozen blueberries, usually swap really great for fresh. Um, they hold their shape really well. They don't, they like will bleed a little bit, but not like crazy. I would not sub frozen strawberries. Frozen raspberries also usually do pretty well if you buy like a nice quality one that, you know, the raspberries stay whole and they're not all smashed together. Um, so I'd say blackberries, raspberries, and blueberries do really well baked from frozen. I wouldn't do strawberries. I generally don't like baking with strawberries because I think they get kind of mushy and weird. Um, but there's one cake that has strawberries only on the top, which works because they're like sliced thin and they get kind of jammy. Um, but generally for me, baked strawberries are enough. I also saw there's one that has freeze dried strawberries, yeah, for the glaze. Yeah, there's- that, Am I making that up? No, you're totally right. Um, there's a cake that has a freeze dried strawberry glaze. And then the strawberry frosting in the book is also made with freeze dried strawberries. Uh, strawberry flavor is kind of hard to work into cakes and baked goods because strawberries do have so much liquid. Um, and that's why the freeze dried ones are super great because they have all of that like concentrated strawberry flavor and also like beautiful red color. So you can mash them up and put them into a glaze or a frosting. Um, and it tastes like vibrant, fresh strawberries without all of the extra liquid. Such a good tip. Yeah, and I'm gonna take the last one from Alexander. Oh, go ahead. Oh, I was just gonna say, you can do that with any, um, any freeze dried berry works, works really well in like a frosting or a, a glaze. Okay, awesome. And Alexandra Stafford writes, hi, Ali. Um, I just wanted to say hi and that I love your book and that I love both of you all. So looking hi. forward to a world in which I can attend one of your events together. Wishing you both so well. XO, XO, Ali. Thanks, Ali. Thanks everybody. That's so lovely. Thank you so much, Aliyah. Thank you so much, Yasi. And Yasi, congratulations on your wonderful book. Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone, for tuning in. As a reminder, you can get a copy of the book. It uh, will have a signed book plate in it at booklarder.com. Have it shipped. Pick it up. Um, thank you, everyone. Happy baking and have a lovely evening. Thanks thank so you. much. Bye. You.